Thank you, Shawnee, and thank you for the, to the greater Nashville uh, team and community here for welcoming us. Stacy, uh, thank you for sharing those thoughts. They were absolutely incredible. Kevin, thank you for everything you shared. It is such uh, inspiration to see what you're doing for the people of Tennessee and the children of Tennessee. And Annie, thank you. Thank you so much for your story. Nine years ago, I was facing one of those two roads diverge in a wood moments. When I graduated from college, I had gone to work as a management consultant. I'd wanted to work on the challenges facing big organizations. But seven years later, I was overcome by the feeling that America wasn't moving in the right direction. And that I wasn't holding up my end of some cosmic bargain to contribute. When Wendy called me that year to ask if I would come work for Teach for America, it felt like a moment that the universe was speaking to me. But it didn't take long before it was hard to hear it over the din of practical considerations. I was scared. This felt like a very big life decision. A move from a place of comfort and lots of options into a very serious commitment. But as I considered the idea, I thought back to the years I spent in New York, where my wife, Katie, was a core member. She taught middle school in Washington Heights for three years. And she would come home every day and collapse from physical and emotional exhaustion. But then, every day, she would get back up and start planning and grading. She knew that she and her students were doing something special together, and it fueled her. I thought back to the projects I worked on for the New York City Board of Education. It was full of incredibly talented and hardworking people who cared deeply about children. And yet, somehow, the system normalized the academic struggles of so many children. Somehow, the system just never seemed to change. But then I also thought back to the pro bono projects I did with Teach for America. And most of the people I met through Teach for America, or through Katie, somehow resisted that urge to call their daily challenges normal. They were angry. And they were hopeful all at once, and it inspired me. I couldn't get myself all the way to an unqualified yes. So I took a two-year sabbatical for my job to work as Teach for America's chief program officer. And those two years were enough to make me understand my end of the cosmic bargain. In 2007, I made the decision to jump, to make a lifelong commitment as all of you have. And I have never regretted it, not once. Today, I know I am right where I am supposed to be, here with you, fighting alongside our many partners for our kids, our communities, and for our integrity. Teach for America is now 24 years old, and like any other 24-year-old looking at a changing world, we have got some questions and some doubts and some fears. Are we making an impact? Are we on the right path? Are we the very best we can be? How should we change to get better? In our first year as co-CEOs, Elise and I spent a lot of time thinking about and asking that last question. How should we change to get better? We've been hearing input from critics and friends. And we've started to lay out a strategic direction with that feedback in mind. But before we talk about what's next, Let's look at where we are today. Today, we've got 24 years of doing this work behind us, 24 years of listening and 24 years of learning. Today, we're in 48 regions across 35 states with thriving alumni communities in many more places. Today, we have 11,000 core members, and our core is more diverse than ever before, 39% of the 2013 core identify as people of color, a quarter are first generation college students. Our 32,000 alumni are part of the vanguard of a growing movement committed to spreading educational equity across America. 
And over the past three years, 85% of them have responded to our survey, so we have a pretty good idea about what they're doing. Approximately 10,000 of them are teaching. Over 750 are school leaders. Over 1,000 are assistant principals or deans. Over 600 are instructional specialists or teacher coaches. 185 are school system leaders. 70 are in elected office. And more than 100 are elected union leaders. All in all, nearly two-thirds of 32,000 alumni remain full-time in education. Others work in social services, law, medicine, other fields. They take with them their belief in the potential of children and in the power of education, and they contribute in so many ways. Nearly 90% of the 32,000 alumni of Teach for America are working full-time for our kids. 90%. Today, our core members are teaching 30, in 3,200 schools across 400 districts. And overall demand for core members is up 40% over the last four years. We are working hard to meet that demand, but many of our most promising prospects are wondering whether they should join this effort. Some things don't change. It has always been hard to convince people to make this choice. And today, it is particularly hard. They are getting more job offers. They are seeing educators under so much stress. And they are actually hearing that the world would be better off if they went to Wall Street instead of teaching in our country's highest need classrooms. Teach for America has changed, though. We are not the same organization we were in 1990. At 24, we're more diverse as a core and a staff. We invest four times as much in the training and support of every single core member. We are doing more than ever to teach and practice cultural responsiveness. We're investing more in early childhood work, in special education, in STEM. And our Teach for America community has built meaningful and lasting relationships all over the country. And in our first year as co-CEOs, Elise and I have continued to embrace change to move us forward. Coming out of the listening tour, we made five commitments for getting better. These commitments started with Elise and me because over the course of our tour, you, our students, and our communities told us they were important, and we are excited to see the broader organization embrace them. We commit to being better listeners. We commit to tailoring our approach to the unique needs of every community. We commit to tempering our data-driven nature with more attention and appreciation for the human stories that tie us all together. We commit to aligning our placements with local demand, not national plans. And we commit to investing more in the support of our core members. You also told us that it was important to take stands that reflect our values, and we have. On the DREAM Act, on admitting DACA core members, on common sense learning standards. And we're going to continue to speak out on issues that affect our students, whether it's poverty, crime, or health care or the right for all students, regardless of their race, or their class, or their gender, or their religion, or their ability, or their sexual orientation, to learn in a safe and affirming environment. We've also been working hard this past year to give regions the flexibility they need to respond to their local context. We want as many decisions as possible being made as close as possible to our kids in our communities. At the same time, we've been reshaping the role of our national staff, so our entire team is focused on learning from the 48 places we work and on supporting our local efforts. When we have 48 regions fully empowered and engaged, we will be better able to live all five commitments. We have come a long way. I think there is a lot for us to be proud of. And at the same time, there is much more to do. We need to keep our minds open to change and innovation as we continue to find new and better ways to do our work. To encourage this kind of innovation, we're setting aside up to $4 million in a breakthrough fund this year and each of the next four years to fund pilots that could lead to significant improvements in our approach. And tonight, I'm excited to share two such pilot programs. 
First, in the days ahead, Elisa and I will reach out to some of the nearly 2,000 college juniors who have already applied to the 2015 Corps, inviting them to take part in a year-long preparation program during their senior year. With this extra pre-service year, we will give them more time to absorb the foundational knowledge that all teachers need, more space to reflect on the role that they're about to step into, and more opportunities to directly practice the skills they'll need as educators, skills like delivering a lesson or managing a classroom. Different paths into the classroom are right for different people. We know that, and we believe this approach will meet the needs of many future core members. We also want to do more to support our alumni educators. These days, most core members teach beyond two years. But we want more people to make that choice. This summer, we're launching a series of programs to provide ongoing support to alumni teachers in their third, fourth, and fifth year. These pilots will take place across 12 regions and will range from teacher practice communities led by alumni to Teach for America staff dedicating time to coaching alumni teachers just as they coach people in the first and second years. Teaching beyond two years cannot be a backup plan. It has to be the main plan. Soon after I joined staff full-time, I started to work with a group of local leaders to bring Teach for America to my hometown. At that time, the dominant narrative in Minnesota was that things were good. We coined the term there, actually, that all the kids are above average. No one was talking about the devastating inequities, that the graduation rates for African American, Latino, and Native American students in Minnesota are dead last, dead last of all 50 states. Seven years later, it is central to the conversation in Minnesota. Back then, there was maybe one school showing great results for low-income students. There was no alternative certification. There was no community-wide advocacy effort. There was no teacher voice for change. Now there are at least a half dozen schools in the Twin Cities where students of all backgrounds succeed. And all the other things I just said are happening too. Minneapolis is not such a big city. And when I look ahead, I can see so clearly the day when every child gets the education they deserve. It is coming. Of course, Teach for America isn't the only force behind all of this. But like in many communities, if you take away the contributions of all of the Teach for America core members and alumni, we would not be seeing the progress we're seeing. Change at the scale our students need does not happen often, and it does not happen by accident. If we're going to see the day when every child has access to an excellent education, if we're going to live up to our national creed, it is going to require so much leadership. It is going to require leadership from students, families, community leaders, facing down educational injustice. It's going to take leadership from tens of thousands of people who haven't yet joined this effort, including many who haven't even finished high school yet. And it is going to take leadership from all of you, contributing in all the ways you do in the classroom, in the field of education, in our communities, and working on the staff of Teach for America to make us better, to make sure that this change we're working towards will not always be in the future tense and that we get there in our lifetimes. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for your remarks and for grounding us in where we are and where we're headed. Tonight, I want to bring us together. I want to unite around our shared passion for this work. I want to share the experiences that have shaped me and tell you why I am personally committed. My mom came to the United States from Mexico at the age of 17 with an eighth grade formal education, and my dad is a first generation college graduate. I grew up in McAllen, Texas, where you will find 85% of the population is Mexican American, and where just 19% of adults have a college degree. Though our values are very strong and rich and an incredible culture, Hidalgo County is one of the poorest regions in this nation. That shaped me. At 18 years old, I met a different America when I went to college. DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana was nothing like home. But that wasn't what troubled me. Well, 
it was a little bit troubling that folks did not know what tamales were or that people literally thought the Taco Bell was real Mexican food. But in all seriousness, um, I'd been a top scholar at my high school, but I quickly realized how academically underprepared I was when I got to college. I literally did not know how to take notes, how to read so much text, process what I was supposed to, take the main point and be able to debate it in a seminar style room with my peers the next day. It was confusing, overwhelming, and maddening, but it shaped me. With a lot of hard work and support, I made it through that first semester. I actually ended up doing well at DePauw. I figured out that I did in fact belong on that campus, and so did all the other kids that I grew up with. But many of them hadn't graduated from high school, let alone made it to college. The realization of that injustice, it shaped me. Joining Teach for America shaped me. Teaching does something to the heart that a book or lecture could never do. I taught beautiful, talented, and incredible children for three years in Phoenix, Arizona, and their potential and ability was undeniable. After that, I headed back to the Rio Grande Valley to lead the Teach for America region, and I grew it to scale. I saw the incredible work of our staff, our core members, our alums, some at my very own high school. They were doing incredible work alongside so many others. They really did good work. These are the things that have shaped me. That's my truth, and I'm living it. And it's why I will not back down from my beliefs. I want to tell you about them tonight, the things I won't back down from. I know I'm not alone in what I believe. I will not back down when folks say the education system is fine as it is. It is simply not. It does not support all children to reach their potential. It was not designed to do that. It was designed to reproduce the status quo. It was designed in willful exclusion of children of color, and it was designed to prepare kids for an economy that has long since changed. So when people say that it is fine as it is, I won't back down. I know better because I know my own story. And I know this. According to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, in a class of 25 Latinos, fourth graders, 20 won't meet proficiency in English. By eighth grade, nearly 90% of African Americans don't reach proficiency in math. Pacific Islander students are half as likely to graduate from high school than the national average. Native American students are more likely than any other group to not have access to AP courses. And nationwide, less than one in 10 kids who grew up in a low-income community will make it through college. The facts tell me clearly that things are not fine. So I won't back down from that. I will not back down when folks suggest that some kids, not their own, of course, don't need high standards because they are probably not going to college anyway or because we are setting them up for failure. No. I've seen what my students, Brianda, Carlos, Oscar, and Anayeli could do. So, so when it comes to high standards and high expectations, I will not back down. When folks tell you that kids of color can't reach the same levels as white kids, do not back down. When folks try to tell you that kids in low-income communities can't reach the same performance as affluent kids, do not back down. Yes, poverty is crippling. Poor health care is debilitating. Child hunger is all too real. We know that kids need good health care and good nutrition. We know that kids need safe cities. It doesn't mean that we stop teaching with high expectation. It means we keep teaching with high expectations. It means we must advocate for our students' basic needs not being met. 
and unmask the violence of the inequity. We must keep teaching, keep our expectations high, keep, the systemic, keep finding the systemic solutions and game-changing innovations. We must do everything we can within education and outside of it to help our students reach their dreams. Our kids are not numbers. They are not statistics. They are children. And they need hope, inspiration, and unwavering belief in what they can do. Teach for America was built on that belief. We will not back down now. We can reach educational equity in our lifetime. It must be done. So when folks try to tell you that it can't, do not back down because we know better. You know your kids and you know your truth. We have evidence that all students can learn. We're hearing more success stories each day and you don't have to take my word for it. Visit any of the hundreds of public schools across our nation that are putting children of color from low-income communities on a different path, on a path that the naysayers never expected. Tell them to visit your classrooms. When folks say it can't be done, we will not back down. And as for Teach for America's role in this, we are a force for good. We will not back down from that either. We are acknowledging our shortcomings and are starting to work to address them. We're not perfect, far from it. The thoughtful, critical feedback we get is a gift and it's helping us evolve. But I'm certain of this, we are a force for good. I wanna be clear. With every step, we remind ourselves that we are not saviors. We are not martyrs. We are not the solution. We are part of a powerful movement that started long before we got here. There is a deep history and context we have to respect. And our communities are our greatest assets. Our parents, families, veteran teachers, neighbors, Teach for America must stay true to that vision because all of us are pushing toward one day. So I want to tell you tonight that I believe in you, I believe in us, and I believe in Teach for America. I know that Teach for America is a force for good because I've seen it in my own community, my own hometown, my own high school. I believe in us because I believe in our teachers. I know it's often a thankless profession, but teachers, I believe in you. We believe in you. Thank you for all that you do. I believe in teachers like Kathy Hollowell Makel, a 1998 DC Corps member who teaches kindergarten at Simon Elementary and who was DC's Teacher of the Year in 2013. Hopefully, you all caught her as one of the first ladies guests at the State of the Union. I believe in us because I believe in Huang Pham. Huang is a 2011 core member and a first grade teacher at Kemp and Power in South Los Angeles. He joined Teach for America because he was taught by a core member himself. And last year, he won the Suleiman Award. Huang's students are academically strong but they're also at six and seven discussing critical issues of race and justice. I believe in that. So when folks tell you that we're not contributing, don't back down. Kids are learning in our classrooms and that's important. Tell them your stories, tell them to, tell them to come visit your colleagues. Point to the study of the Department of Education and Mathematical Policy Research. Show them the studies right here in Tennessee. They don't say we're perfect, but they do say we're making a difference for kids. Parents and students will tell you the same thing. A good teacher is a good teacher, no matter how they're trained or where they come from. And we've got good teachers. So when folks tell you that Teach for America is expanding without bounds, growing without regard to what communities need, explain. It's simply not true. 
This year, roughly a third of our regions reduced in core size. We get bigger when we have to grow, and we get smaller when we have to be smaller. We place teachers only in positions that are already open, only when principals and districts want to hire them. And it's working. Over 90% of those principal leaders would recommend another principal to hire our teachers. When folks tell you that Teach for America is anti-union, just give them the facts. Remind them that thousands of our teachers are union members. Remind them that over 100 alums of ours hold leadership positions in teacher unions across the nation. That is the truth. And when folks tell you that Teach for America Corps members all look one way, all come from the same background, don't back down. We're far more diverse than the teaching profession as a whole. The majority of our first year teachers, 55% are either core members of color or came from a low income background. And when folks say that our teachers are temporary, introduce them to the, say, to the great alumni spending their fifth and 10th and 20th year in the classroom, the more than 10,000 alumni teaching today. Remind them that our first year retention rate is higher than the national average, that the most common profession of our alumni is teaching, and two thirds of all of our alumni are working in education. And no matter what, this is not a two year commitment. Two years is just the beginning. Alumni become lifelong educators and advocates, fighting for children, fighting for justice. We are in this for life. Our alumni who don't teach still educate, or they tackle poverty, health care, and other challenges that the educational world cannot take on on its own. Teach for America staff, core members, and alumni have diverse thoughts and diverse opinions. But we are anchored around one common belief, that all children deserve an excellent education. And we won't back down from that. Like so many of you, I fell in love with the kids in my classroom, and it changed me forever. No one can ever take that away from us, and for as long as we live, we will always have real skin in this game. So we will keep fighting this fight. We will keep working. We will keep teaching. We will keep learning. We will keep improving, committing, questioning, innovating, loving. We will keep at this for as long as it takes. We will not back down. Thank you. <laughs>